Theology was crowned the queen of sciences by Thomas Aquinas. In this second part, we look at whether philosophy trumps theology by the magisterial use of reason or whether theology reigns as king over philosophy. Unpacking this question is key to our upcoming lengthy yet bite-sized series on natural theology, where we look at the arguments for God's existence. And who better to tackle this question than the nightmare of atheism and one of the world's leading theologians, Dr. William Lane Craig himself. This is an episode that you cannot afford to miss. Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another episode of SAF Podcast. Thank you for joining us. And if you're listening or watching the episode, you know the drill. Stay subscribed to be updated on all of our upcoming contents. And if you enjoy your work, do share a review and uh, on your favorite listening platforms. And joining me once again is our very own Dr. William Lane Craig. Dr. Craig, it's an absolute delight to have you once again back on SAF Podcast. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. Good to be with you. So th- this would be your third appearance uh, with, reg- with uh, relation to SAFT apologetics. You were there the first time, I think, uh, in early 2020. So this was in February of 2020 before COVID was uh, a thing at all. And we talked about Molinism. And then recently, again, in February of 2021, you were our final day speaker at the Areopagus 2021 conference. And here yes. you're back again. It's, it's such a delight to have you here with us, sir. Thank you. And uh, so if, if, you've, if you've been someone who has been catching up with SAF podcast for the past while, then, you know, Dr. Craig is not someone who needs an introduction. And so therefore, I want to just dive right in. He is one of the world's leading philosophers and theologians on the topic and someone whom the Lord has been using greatly to reach both the skeptic and the believer in strengthening the believer's faith and also challenging the skeptic, while also challenging how the culture looks at Christianity through the means of Christian apologetics. And so the, the topic that we have before us is something uh, a bit too uh, deep, I may say. And uh, when I was thinking about whom do I bring on to talk about philosophy and theology, I was reminded of Dr. Craig's uh, mega work that he's working on. I, I think it, could, it can be tagged as your magnum opus, your work on systematic theology. And that was a brilliant example of how a world-class philosopher is uh, using his excellent philosophical skills to deal with questions on theology. So Dr. Craig, uh, how has that been going along? I, I hear from your newsletter that it has been speeding along. Yes, it is. It's been a very productive year for me writing it. I'm currently writing on the doctrine of God and was working today on the divine attribute of omnipresence. Uh, the central question there is whether God's omnipresence means that God exists in space or whether God transcends space and is spaceless. So mm-hmm. that's the question I'm contemplating. Well, that's a, that's a very deep question. And I believe that your years of work into the field uh, through the means of philosophy is deeply helping you uh, in, taking into, in taking into consideration how the philosophical world looks at it then bring along the theological implications. So yes. uh, Dr. Craig, we had covered what philosophy is and how it related to science when we had Kenneth samples from RTB on. Uh, Mm -hmm. So when we look at theology, can you quickly lay out what we generally mean by theology or who a theologian is? Well, I think theology can be understood as an academic discipline or Mm -hmm. a task. And if we think of theology in that way, it is the study of God. Now, what would be some of the various branches of theology? Well, they would include, for example, biblical theology, which would be an exegetical study of the Christian scriptures, historical theology, which would be a kind of intellectual history of dogma hmm. down through the centuries, philosophical theology would examine uh, Christian doctrine for its philosophical coherence and plausibility. And then systematic theology is an attempt to summarize and systematize the whole body of Christian doctrine. And that's what I'm involved in writing right now is a systematic theology. So what does systematic theology look like when it is pursued by professional theologians? Hmm. Well, as theology, its subject matter is God and things considered in relation to God. Uh, So, for example, theological anthropology is contrasted with secular anthropology, 
will consider man insofar as he stands in relation to God. So it is a study of God and things considered in relation to him. Well, what makes the systematic theology systematic? Well, here I would point to four features of it. First, it is organized or structured, typically along certain themes uh, called the loci communes or common places, the chief themes of systematic theology, like doctrine of God, doctrine of creation, doctrine of man, doctrine of salvation, and so forth. Secondly, it draws upon both authoritative scriptures as well as all relevant secular disciplines. Thirdly, it aims at completeness. It wants to enunciate at least the broad outlines of a synoptic worldview. And finally, it offers and defends uh, insofar as it can, a logically coherent and plausible formulation of its worldview. And so that is how I understand the task of systematic theology. Yeah, and then could we say that a theologian is someone who deals with the question of God and the attributes of God and the nature of God in that, in that regard? Well, I would say a theologian is someone pr who pursues the study that I just described. It's a practitioner hmm. of that field of study that I just characterized. Right. So, because uh, my question was, do we look at people like Graham Opie, Planning and Proust, as equally theologians as someone like the great J.A. Packer? Well, I don't. I think you could say this about Alvin Planning, because Alvin right. Planning is certainly considers the bearing of Christian scripture upon the formulations of Christian doctrine that he hmm. defends. But I don't think you could say that someone like Graham Oppie or even Alexander Proust are equally theologians, because so far as I know, the input of scripture into their work is hmm. almost nil. Right. Uh, I'm not aware that they do any sort of biblical exegesis or attempt to um, assess their viewpoints based upon whether it's biblically consistent. And as I explained a moment ago, I do think that the appeal to authoritative scripture is inherent to the task of theology. Yeah, and so for that regard, then it's, you know, it, it's well within ration to keep the Kalam cosmological argument, fine-tuning moral ontological arguments as strictly philosophical arguments than to tag them as theological arguments. Well, I would characterize them as philosophical mm. arguments. I would say they are exercises in philosophical theology in that they mm. offer philosophical arguments uh, that do not appeal to special revelation or authoritative scripture for conclusions that have theological significance. Very often, this field is called natural theology. Right. Um, and so insofar as a theologian is engaged in doing natural theology, he's doing philosophical theology. Excellent. Yes. And, and that sort of clears up some of the boundaries between philosophy and theology, especially when you outline what philosophical theology is. I think that's going to be uh, unique to most of our listeners, because they may be familiar with systematic theology, uh, they may be familiar with biblical theology, but the field of philosophical theology is a bit unique. Maybe it is it is because it is not that clearly tagged as such when it is presented. Maybe it is just presented as theology to the common audience. So that is that is that is very helpful in in finding that distinction. And yeah, when I, I was... think that the, the difficulty, Jacob, is that whereas the philosophical component of theology was once very prominent hmm. in the work of theologians like Anselm and mm. uh, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and John Dunn Scotus and William Ockham, it has been eclipsed in the modern era and neglected. But fortunately, as a result of the work of Christian philosophers, um, it's really coming back. And there's a whole discipline now or sub-discipline of theology that calls itself analytic theology, and it is an application of the tools of analytic philosophy to specifically theological 
questions. And so insofar as it is the task of the systematic theologian to formulate a logically coherent hmm. and plausible uh, worldview, I think that philosophy is inherent to the task of systematic theology. And any theology that neglects philosophy, I think, is just doing poor theology. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is why when I was thinking about Alvin Plantinga's, you know, that simple definition about philosophy, where he says philosophy is thinking really hard about God, which mm. made me wonder when you when you were explaining about theology, could we say that theology, therefore, is thinking really hard about God with scripture? So I think, what do you, what do you think about that? Yes, yes. I think you, you need to include the input of authoritative scripture mm. into the task of theology. And then also, remember what I said a few moments ago, at least systematic theology isn't just thinking hard about God, but it's also thinking systematically hmm. about God, trying to outline the broad contours of a Christian world and life view that is integrated with the findings of the secular disciplines at the university. So it, it's a systematic task as well as a task of just thinking hard. Right, right. And, you know, when Thomas Aquinas looked at the field of theology and he tagged as the queen of sciences, uh, if, if we were to include all of the you know, field of discipline that we study today, including philosophy and theology and all of it, would you say that Thomas Aquinas' characterization of theology as the queen of science includes theology being queen over philosophy in some sense? Or what was Thomas Aquinas getting at when he said that? Well, I think there are two things involved here. First would be the very practical sense in which a person in the medieval university was not allowed to study theology until he had first gone through all of the other disciplines at the university, hmm. including such studies as logic and mathematics and metaphysics and so forth. And so the pinnacle of his studies would then be theology. But I also think that theology is the queen of the sciences in the sense that it outranks them. It is authoritative. It is God-based mm -hmm. um, in authoritative scripture, uh, and, and therefore, I think, um, speaks authoritatively to the other disciplines at the university. Right. And we actually come to a, a critical point of, of question that I want to present, and uh, we actually sort of laid the groundwork really well when talking about how philosophy and theology interact. And I came across this uh, video clip from Todd Frail of Russian Radio, and he was actually responding to you. So I thought, uh, you know, instead of us responding to Todd Frail, we'll look at just the objections that he raised, because he mm -hmm. touches on theology and where Christian philosophers stand and all of that. So uh, his, his objection was specific to, you, to your reference to the virgin birth of Jesus. And uh, when I looked at it, primarily had to do with the philosophical wording that we normally deploy. So, uh, like I said, we we'll leave Todd Frail out of this and we'll just look at the objection. So right. here is Todd Frail. Question, are you actually confident that Jesus was born to a, a virgin? William Lane Craig says, I'm reasonably confident. Wow. Yeah. That's disturbing. That is just disturbing. Why? Well, because we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter's saying it's more sure than his personal experience. Uh, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, the most spectacular thing he ever saw with his own eyes, the glory of Christ unveiled, and he describes that event, and then he says, but we have a more sure word Something of prophecy. Something even better than a yeah. sign. And he's talking about the Scriptures. So if the Scriptures say it, I'm more sure of that than I am any, any other facts I know. Here's, here's where I think that comes from. I've seen Christian philosophers. I'm always a little bit leery of yeah. putting those two words together. Same here. Because the philosophy tends to overshadow the Christianity. Yeah. And so from a logic and reasoning standpoint, it's logical and reasonable to conclude that this could happen. So yeah. I'm reasonably certain but that's not a Christian response. No, it's not. And uh, I'm absolutely certain. Yeah. I'm totally certain. Yeah. L look, we're reasonable. We reason. We're logical people. But we don't use reason and logic 
And we certainly don't have it sit on top of scriptures. It serves our understanding of the Bible, right. but it doesn't trump. So, Dr. Craig, that was Todd and Phil Johnson on the Russia radio. And uh, first up, and I just want to break it down in two questions. Uh, is it unchristian to say that I'm reasonably certain that Jesus was born of a virgin? And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to look at the entire video because they go on a slippery slope towards the resurrection. Um, and and they have a bit of logical fallacies thrown in, some proctor hoc, uh, go post hoc and all of that, and some uh, slippery slope as well. So we definitely don't want to look at all of it, but just strictly uh, restricting to what they basically said there. Um, uh, why don't we say something like, I'm definitely certain that Jesus was yeah. born of a virgin. Why do we have the philosophical limbo? Yeah, I, I think that these fellows have simply misunderstood what I'm saying. I am very, very certain that the scriptures teach the doctrine of the virgin birth, that Jesus was uh, conceived without human sexual intercourse. That's very clear that the scripture teaches the virgin birth. But the question is, how reasonably certain are we that what the scripture says is true? Um, and that's a completely different question there. One would need to ask, um, on what basis do we believe that the Christian scriptures are true? And how do we know that this um, element in scripture uh, was in fact uh, historical? And when you approach that question from a philosophical and historical point of view, then my position is actually pretty strong to say that we can be reasonably certain that what the scriptures say is true. So we're talking here about two different questions. Hmm. One question would be, um, are we certain that the Christian scriptures teach the virgin birth of Jesus? Yes, that is certain. How certain are we that the Christian scriptures are true and I would say uh, that there uh, we can be reasonably certain that the Christian scriptures are true. Yeah, and also it, it would touch upon the point of whether when we look at the, the scripture pointing towards virgin conception or any other topic, we would have to look at it and see uh, about the, the linguistic context and whether scripture presents it in any figurative sense or not. And I think Todd Frail and uh, Phil Johnson want to look at whole scripture in a very literary sense in a very literal sense, and maybe that is why they're asking the question of uh, why are we saying reasonably certain? Why can't we just straight out uh, tag it into the category and say, I'm totally certain? So I think they're missing out on that key distinction that you point out. But Todd also touches on the point of the magisterial and the ministerial use of reason. And now this was a very fascinating for, point for me to come across when I was going through the book, Reasonable Faith. Uh, so Dr. Mm -hmm. Ray, can you highlight what, it, what we mean by the magisterial and the ministerial use of reason? What I meant there is that reason is a God-given tool to help us to better understand and defend our faith. And as such, I think uh, the teaching of Scripture trumps human reason. It's similar to the point that we were talking about before, hmm. that um, theology is the queen of the sciences. Right. So uh, if I find myself coming to a conclusion that is at odds with the teaching of Scripture, I look for my error. I try to see mm -hmm. uh, what mistake I have made, rather than say that the Scriptures are false. Yeah, so then, uh, so then it's not exactly Scripture versus reason. It's basically Scripture versus my line of reasoning then. Because when I look at Scripture, I'm definitely deploying reasoning. And when you talked about systematic theology, we are definitely deploying reasoning to work through scripture. So when, it, when for example, I, I find a conclusion and I see it's at odds with scripture, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that um, I have to look at my, my line of reasoning than just say scripture versus reason at that point? I, that's, that's what I'm touching at. Are you, are you getting what I'm pointing at? I'm afraid I'm not. Uh, you're going to have to explain that to me. Yeah, so, so my thought was, when I look at scripture and I say, hey, this is what scripture says. Yes. Now, to reach that conclusion, I definitely have to use reasoning when I look at scripture, when I go through the passages and I do my hermeneutics and all of, of that. And I get to a conclusion. 
and then i see and let's say i get to the conclusion completely differently and distinctly from scripture and so if i see that these both conclusions are at odds you would say we have to ask uh, whether we hold scripture to a higher pedestal or our reasoning to a higher pedestal and so my yes. question is should we put it as scripture versus reason or scripture versus my line of reasoning maybe it's not reason oh, that is better oh well of course of course there's no conflict between scripture and the truth between scripture hmm. and reason but it would be as you put it between scripture and my line of reasoning that's why i said if i come to some conclusion that's contrary to the clear teaching of scripture i look for my error i i try to figure out where i've made a mistake um but as you point out of course we use reason and logic in determining what scripture teaches so when todd says in this interview we don't use reason and logic uh that's just self defeating that that's crazy yeah and, and interestingly todd also comes along and says of course we are logical pe- uh, people of course we reason so that itself points out the tension that that persists you know when we Uh, try and keep scripture and reason to the sides because uh, everyone accepts the fact that you have got to th- think clearly when it, yes. working with hermeneutics there and so that right. is what otherwise you could believe contradictions yes uh when they do their biblical exegesis they try to find a plausible and consistent interpretation of what the scripture teaches yeah and and maybe that is why i felt not exactly satisfied with how we present the magisterial and the ministerial use of reason because uh, we use reason definitely and i and i often felt that we would have to characterize it specifically as and distinctly as the human way of reasoning than just use the word reason because i felt that it may be construed as us saying we will blindly believe uh, what scripture says and I, and i believe that it may be misconstrued so not as that we believe so that we are keeping reasoning and Uh, critical thinking out of our understanding of scripture but could be the case that an atheist could pick up how we present the magisterial and the ministerial use of reason to say oh it looks like the christians are not concerned with reason they just want to believe what scripture says well i i don't think that anybody who read what i write about this in reasonable faith would come to that sort of conclusion that that would only be by taking it out of context i think it's very clear um that what i'm talking about is that when uh in our studies you come to a conclusion that looks contrary to the clear teaching of scripture that you shouldn't therefore say i have now falsified scripture uh i have shown it to be in error and and wrong instead you should look for the error in your reasoning yeah and 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 a point it touched on about looking it within the context and i think that is something that often atheists try to bring about in and you've seen this throughout your your history and your work what how they would like to take out uh, where we stand theologically and this is something that i hope we can touch on later on what how they would look at christian philosophers and take a point on where they stand on theologically and this was very interesting to, for me to see an encounter first person people bringing objections to christian philosophers based on their theological standpoints and maybe when when we get time we'll towards the end of the podcast we'll get to touch on it and the next question that that i want to draft and uh, that i drafted is and this specifically had to do with todd asking you know why are we using these sort of philosophical objections and I, and for example and this is the the example that i drafted uh if given the two following statements which would you say is true uh, would you say jan loves me or it's highly probable that jan loves me and the reason that i use these two examples is i felt that in our daily life we never go to the extent to say oh it's highly probable we don't use the words it's highly reasonable in our daily conversations we just straight out say as tot pointed out i'm totally certain but when i as a lay person look at uh, many philosophical writings and philosophical presentations the words reasonable probable are are much placed in so in our daily conversations do you think that sort of or when we look at scripture also do we need to include those words it's highly probable it's highly reasonable or does it suffice to just say it is 
Well, I think that in ordinary language and everyday conversation, we do use expressions like it's likely that, hmm. or uh, it, it seems probable, or I think that. And we don't express absolute certainty about most things. In any case, it seems to me that this is all really a red herring, Jacob, because hmm. confidence um, is a psychological property that has nothing to do with truth. Right. I remember when our son was 17 years old, he was extremely confident in everything. Trust me, dad, he would say. But that didn't mean that he was right, that he, he was had the truth. Hmm. You can be absolutely certain of something that turns out to be a falsehood, and you can be reasonably uh, confident in something that is necessarily true. So I just don't see that this is an important issue at all. Um, we do our best to try to arrive at the truth through the use of uh, argument and evidence, and we accept those conclusions that seem to be the most probable. Yeah, and, and, I, and I'm happy that we were able to get through all of that objections uh, that they both raised on the radio, because like you pointed out, it was... Uh, it stood out to be as a key red herring uh, that they deployed with working with the wordings because uh, for some reason they did not look at uh, where you stood theologically on it. And that was an interesting point. Uh, I had an, an atheist, and this was an, in your lecture at Biola when you present the talk on 10 worst objections to the Kalam. Objections so bad mm -hmm. I couldn't have brought them up. The first point that you mentioned about was your stance on the self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit and how atheists would come up and say, oh, look at that. You know, Dr. Craig, he says, even if the Kalam is wrong, he would still believe in God. And I saw this very interesting that there are Christians on one side who would look at what a philosopher would say philosophically to point out that they're the theologically errant. And there are atheists on the other side who would look at where a, a philosopher holds something to something theologically and then try and point out that they are philosophically errant. <laughs> uh, how do we present to them, to those two uh, end of the spectrum individuals and say that what is the best way to deal with it? Well, I describe a kind of double warrant that we have for mm. our Christian truth claims. On the one hand, we have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, which gives us an inner assurance of the truth of Christian uh, faith that is not based on evidence and argument. So that even if all of the arguments were refuted, we can still have confidence that Christianity is true based upon the inner witness of God's Spirit. Right. But in addition to that, we have a second source of warrant, which is the arguments and evidence mm -hmm. for Christian truth claims. And as you know, I think there are very good arguments for the existence of God and evidences for his self-revelation in Jesus that support Christian truth claims. So I'm doubly warranted in my Christian belief. I have the, as it were, external warrant of the arguments and evidence, right. and then I have the internal warrant of the witness of the Holy Spirit. And what would, and this is not an objection that you would, I don't think you would ever face from someone like Graham Opie or Alex Malpas or any uh, uh, well-reputed atheist philosophers. But what if you know, a lay atheist comes along and challenges your theological commitment to this inner uh, witness of the Holy Spirit? Why do you think that your theological commitment is irrelevant to how good a philosopher you are? Because I know you, you're, going to, you're going to be wondering why this question, but their atheists have reached out to us and said, they think you are a poor philosopher, not because of anything you've done philosophically, but just because you hold on to the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, which has left us completely bewildered. Yeah. If that were true, then that would mean that Alvin Plantinga, who is one of the greatest living philosophers in the world, is not a good philosopher. Mm. And I take that conclusion to be the reductio <laughs> ad absurdum of this argument. If Alvin Planning is not a great philosopher, then nobody is. The fact is that you can defend philosophically mm. the view that we can have warranted beliefs that are not based upon uh, inferential arguments and mm. evidence. And Planning has written a whole book, Warranted Christian Belief, on this 
subject. So these people are, I think, are just ignorant, frankly, uh, and need to engage with planning as religious epistemology. Yeah, I, I wonder if they're even aware of planning as great philosophical work. Uh, but uh, we have, I think, enough time to look at two more questions. And uh, the next one is uh, with relation to John 17 verse 5. And I hope that I will be able to present what I have in mind uh, clearly to you. I had to work through this question in my mind a lot. Um, so we see in John 17 verse 5 that Christ shared glory with the Father before the world was. Now, when we look at arguments like the Kalam, cosmological argument, and as such, and we hold in light of modern scientific evidence that uh, time began to exist with the creation of the universe. So, so my question is, does the philosophy of time research undercut the heretical Unitarian teaching that Christ was the Father's first creative act and was created prior to the creation of the universe, which would mean prior to time beginning to exist. Now, I may be wrong, uh, but I, I'm thinking that this could be a strong philosophical objection to the Unitarian position, and it, it's probable that I could be missing something here. And just for our audience to touch on what Unitarian position is, they say that God the Father, the Father alone is the one true God, and Christ was the first creation of the Father. They refer to uh, Revelation 3.14. And they would say Christ was the Father's first creation. He's the Messiah, Savior, but he's the first creation. So that's what the Unitarian position is. So what do you think, Dr. Craig? Is that a good philosophical objection? Am I missing something here? I don't think so, Jacob. Uh, the assumption here is that time began to exist with the beginning of the universe. Uh, and while that's possible and is a simple view, it's not necessarily true. Um, if we imagine God existing prior to creation, temporally, and counting down to creation, five, four, three, two, one, let there be light, then clearly there would be a mental series of events prior to the origin of the universe. Hmm. And that series of mental events alone would be sufficient for time. So in that case, there would be time prior to the beginning of the physical universe. And theologically, uh, where this could come into play would be if God created the angelic realms hmm. prior to his creation of the physical universe. The Bible doesn't really say when God created right. the angels, um, but it's perfectly possible that he created the angels uh, temporally prior to his creating the physical universe. So even if physical time, that is to say, the time studied in modern physics begins at the Big Bang, metaphysical time, God's time, could have preceded the beginning of the universe, in which case the Unitarian or Arian yeah. view uh, would be possible that the hmm. first creative act of God was not the universe, but was creating Christ. Yeah. And I know we, we're going into deep uh, philosophical post, uh, question on metaphysical time, but I, so I don't want to digress into that. Uh, but to our audience who uh, who may not be that cut out philosophically, just like I am, uh, should they be concerned with pointing towards scientific evidence for the beginning of time in that sense? I think that the scientific evidence for the beginning of space and time in a physical sense is very strong. But the question of whether or not there was a kind of metaphysical time prior to creation, I think is a question that can't be settled scientifically. How do we know what God was doing hmm. before creating the universe? Perhaps he was creating angels. Right. And so there was an amount of time prior to his creation of the physical universe. It's a question which science doesn't answer. Now, since we don't know when God created the angelic realm, hmm. and since it's rather silly to think of God <laughs> counting down to creation, um, I think the simpler view is to simply accept that the beginning of time uh, was coincident with the beginning of the universe. And you would say the when you said the beginning of time is coincident with the beginning of the universe, metaphysical or physical? Yes, yes, I think that's the simpler view. It, it's not necessary. He could have been creating angels, 
prior to creation or counting down to creation, but there's no reason to think such a thing. The simplest view is to say that time began at the beginning of the universe. So maybe in that sense, do you think that the objection stands for the Unitarian? Well, I still don't think that because, hmm. um, because, because like you said, the Aryan would offer some sort of theological or metaphysical reason for thinking that Christ was created prior to the hmm. beginning of the universe. Right. And if he can give some sort of good argument for that, then you would have to hmm. take that into account. You couldn't just dismiss it by saying, well, it's simpler to have time begin at the beginning of the universe. If he's got some argument right. for God's creating Christ or mm. angels or something prior to creation, you've got to deal with the argument. Yes, yeah. And we've come to the, the, the conclusion of this very riveting conversation. Uh, I, I think this was the, the only podcast where I, I asked questions and I was left to scramble quickly and rework through the questions. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Craig, for uh, sort of challenging me in that sense. And I think it's obviously expected of someone of your rank. And the final question is, and I'm very excited to ask this because uh, I emailed Dr. Alexander Proust and I said, uh, Dr. Proust, Dr. Craig is coming on on the podcast. And this is the topic that we're going to talk about. Do you have a question for Dr. Craig? And he sent me one. And I was super surprised to see that. Yeah, from Dr. Amazing. Proust. <laughs> and so this question actually ties in and he has put it very well. He is, uh, I mean, it need not be mentioned that Dr. Alexander Proust put it very well. Uh, but so this ties in really well. And so here is the question from Dr. Alexander Proust. He asks, suppose it looks to you that on purely textual grounds, including our knowledge of the textual context, the original languages and the culture in which the inspired texts were written, the best reading of scripture suggests that scripture asserts a proposition P and yet the best philosophical arguments you know lead to not P. How would you resolve that? Would you allow mm. non-textual considerations like philosophical ones to supplement the textual ones when interpreting scripture? What Alex is asking about here, I think, is the doctrine of scripture. Mm. Scripture has a doctrine of scripture. And the principal and most important passage for the doctrine of scripture is 2 Timothy 3.16, which says that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Hmm. Now, notice that it is the scriptures that are inspired, not the authors of scripture. The right. scriptures are literally God-breathed, hmm. and therefore they are profitable for various purposes. And the four purposes that are mentioned can be classed as either pedagogical purposes or pastoral purposes. Hmm. The two pedagogical purposes for which scriptures are valuable is instruction in Christian doctrine, or in the Greek, didaskalia, hmm. and for reproof, elengmos, uh, which is the correction right. of false doctrine. So what the scriptures are valuable for is for um, Christian teaching with respect to doctrine and ethics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not the case that everything that Scripture asserts is true. What is the case is that everything that Scripture teaches about mm -hmm. doctrine and morals is true. And so if you run into statements that seem to you to be falsehoods that are found in Scripture, mm -hmm. I think evangelical interpreters would tend to deny that those are part of the teaching of right. Scripture. It's important to understand here that the teaching of Scripture is not identical to the assertions hmm. of Scripture. And I think a real acid test for any 
tenable doctrine of inspiration is the imprecatory psalms, Hmm. where the psalmist prays these horrible things to happen to those who are his enemies, including dashing the skulls of their babies against the rocks. On the position I would defend, I would say that this prayer, um, despite its vengeful and ugly sentiments, is not contrary to divine inspiration, because divine inspiration doesn't imply a kind of dictation Hmm. theory. Um, Rather, I would understand this prayer to be appropriated speech. Hmm. It is a prayer which God knew that the outraged psalmist would offer in his anguish, and then God appropriates this prayer as his word to us, much in the way that a boss might uh, appropriate a letter written by his secretary by appending his signature to Mm -hmm. that letter, thereby making it his own words. So why would God include such a horrid prayer in the scripture, which is contrary to good ethical thinking? What does he intend Mm -hmm. to teach by these imprecatory psalms? Well, I think it could be that he's trying to teach us the importance of being honest with God, of coming to him just Mm. as we are with no pretense of piety, expressing Mm. honestly the depth of our anger or disappointment with God or doubts about God, as the psalmist often do. Uh, These and other psalms are meant to teach us that God receives us just as we are and are open to our prayers. So inerrancy attaches to what the Scripture teaches, Hmm. not just what the Scripture says or asserts, only what the Scripture teaches is guaranteed to be true. So if you find yourself led by a philosophical argument to contradict what you take to be the teaching of Scripture, I think what you do is you go back and ask yourself, is this something that Scripture really teaches? Right. Maybe I've misunderstood it. Maybe this is an assertion in Scripture, but it's not part of the teaching of hmm. Scripture. On the other hand, as I indicated earlier in this interview, it may be that when you go back and look at your philosophical argument, you find an error in your reasoning, and that, in fact, good philosophical reasoning is not contradictory to the teaching of Scripture. So the answer to Alex's question, in short, is yes, there is a symbiotic Hmm. relationship here between Scripture and philosophical argument in that um, philosophical argument can help us to discern what is the teaching of Scripture, Hmm. and the teaching of Scripture can help us to call into question at times what our philosophical arguments may lead us to conclude. Yeah, and I think a great point to touch on, because there is a very good chance that a bulk of the audience who are tuning in uh, may be given into the whole idea that the entire scripture is teaching, that there is no part scripture asserts, every part of scripture is teaching, teaching so every part um, is equally in the right. Maybe an example would be uh, like when, when the Lord tells to Moses, I will turn my back and you shall see the glory from behind. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we look at uh, philosophical arguments and we can't say God has a material uh, essence and he's a material being with a material back. So that would be a good example for us to, you know, for someone who is qu- uh, wondering what is Dr. Craig pointing about? Just as we would come to that point and we say the scripture is not teaching that God has some sort of a material back, but it's an assertion there. And we have to distinct that, uh, those two parts to apply the doctrine of inerrancy. And for those of you who are wondering about that, look into Dr. Craig's phenomenal defenders class. You can find, I'll, I'll drop it in the link and he goes through phenomenally about the doctrine of scripture and inerrancy really well. And uh, so that's it. We have come to the end of this engaging conversation. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Craig, for taking time and being here with us. Certainly, Jacob. May the Lord bless you and uh, all my brothers and sisters in India. Amen. Thank you, sir. And thank you so much to our audience for tuning in and on the next episode onwards, me and Ankit, uh, or Piyush, as you may know him, will be coming back and we will be starting our long-awaited journey into natural theology as we take slow, bite-sized steps to enable you to understand the arguments for the existence of God. So these would be casual, 
back and forth conversations to work through the arguments uh, for the existence of god so that you may be well equipped to share the gospel confidently uh, wherever you may go so thank you for joining us and we will catch you in the next one until then stay safe and god bless